So we're having some microphone issues this morning. We're not capturing everything we need on the board in the back. And I've become handicapped. I have. I'm limited now because I'm used to wearing a lapel mic and not holding a mic. So the way I do it, it this is very awkward for me right now. But we're going to work through it because I need for it to be amplified. But he was on time when we didn't have microphones in church. Before all these modern conveniences got in the way, somebody would just stand up and say, ain't he all right? I know he's all right. I know he is. Oh, he's all right. When I wake up in the morning, He's all right. Hey. Yeah, everything convenient ain't good. Wow. It'll mess you up sometimes. Because we just want to hear the word, don't we? Yeah, that's all. We just want to hear the word. And so. Yeah, you can put all these mics all around me. I'll probably fall, <laughs> jumping around. It's all right. Thank you. They so help. I appreciate them. Darius and Jeremiah and everybody, everybody in the back, the whole Maddox family in the booth. And I just came to tell the story today. That's all. That's all. I just want to come and talk about Jesus. Because he is an on-time God. If you don't know it, I challenge you to try. I'm good. All right. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you. We're going to struggle through the struggle. Yeah, pray for me. Yeah, pray, pray, pray that the Lord will amplify your hearing. Even if, the, if my voice doesn't get louder, maybe your hearing will be amplified. I don't know. But we're going to make it, make it through it all right. How many of y'all know that today is a day that God gave you and there's something he expects from you today? Yeah, yeah. Not, not just to be here for form or fashion. But there's a purpose in today. There's a purpose in you coming into this worship service today. Your purpose is different than my purpose. I'm on mission to come here and tell you about Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know what your mission is, but you need to learn how to ask the Lord, what is it you expect of me, Lord? What am I here to do? What, what's in the message? Is there instruction in it for me? Is there guidance? Is there reproof in it for me? God aims to tell you, tell you something. He gave Monica a memory this morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's bittersweet. Yeah, but it's a memory because her grandma used to sing that song in this choir. Yeah, and guess what? For his for, for Miss Lodi, he was on time. And he's still on time. Yeah. So cry and sing, Monica. It's all right. It's all right. Everybody understand that. And if you don't, like George Jones used to say, just keep living. You'll get to a place where you understand why you can cry and sing at the same time. Why you have to sometime. Today starts the period in our worship season that we call Advent. Advent. It's Advent, big word, simply means coming. The coming. We're expecting something. Everybody's expecting something. The question is, what are you expecting? For those of us who are in the body of Christ, we anticipate the most blessed day of the year. Not, not, not because the folk in marketing tell us it's the most wonderful time of the year. I hope we're mature enough to get beyond that. 
to get past the marketing schemes and the, the snowmen and, 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 and all the ill. I hope we are intelligent enough to get beyond that and know that there's a greater purpose in this season we celebrate. But when we start talking about the, uh, the Advent season, if we talk about it in its truest theological terms, I won't go too far into the conversation before I start seeing people nodding off. Yeah, it can be kind of staid, kind of boring even when we talk about it, not to mention the fact that we hit this season every time of the year. And so a preacher has the opportunity and the obligation to enliven the discussion so that we can get something out of it every time. And, and so the Lord has led me to some scripture, to one particular verse that I think we can talk from today. Led, there's, a, there's an under scripture I want to use. It's Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. And I'm not going to read that for you. I want you to stick a pen in it. And if you're mature enough and you will, go back. And read Malachi 3, 1 through 4. Simply talks about the coming of the Lord. But it references one who would come and foretell the Messiah's coming. And that story can be found in Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And I want to read a couple of those verses in Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Starting at verse 4, Luke writes these words. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. For every valley shall be filled in, and every mountain and hill will be made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, and the rough ways will become smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. The word of God came to John. I'm underlining these next three words. In the wilderness. The word of God came to John. In, in the wilderness. John was living. In, in the wilderness. Now, now be honest with you. I'm going to stop reading right there. Be honest with me. How many of y'all like walking in the woods? Raise your hand. Yeah. Oh. How many of you have ever been in Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or something like that? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what about the Army? The military? Yeah. Dean Hall, I remember we would be in, in, in going into some field training when I was in the Army. <clears throat> and we'd be riding in the truck with all our gear, bouncing along. And I would see this kudzu-covered hillside. Looks so nice. Just riding and riding, angry. And we stop, and they tell us, fall out. And we fall out. Get in line. And would you believe that in 15 minutes, we were in that kudzu, in that kudzu-covered hillside. And I don't know about everybody else, Deacon Hall, I mean Deacon Moore, but I was mad. <laughs> and I realized that this ain't for me. <laughs> Walking in the woods like this, Deacon Moore made a career out of it in the field trainings, I mean, it, it, as a, an extension officer. But uh, going into the wilderness may not be for everybody. But can I tell you that if you're in the body of Christ, we live in wilderness experiences. Yeah. And when I say the word wilderness, immediately negative things start coming to mind. When I, when I say that, you start thinking about 
you know, barren wastelands and, and, and deep untouched forests and, and stuff making sounds that you can't see and jumping around ahead of you. And it, it immediately makes you feel uncertain. And, and, and the worst for me is spiders crawling all over you. <laughs> Yeah, walking in the spider's webs, I mean, that's just always a treat in the wilderness. A few weeks ago, um, Karen and I had the, uh, the joy, I'll say, of going to Red Mountain Park with the Davis family. And we hiked in Red Mountain Park a few weeks ago, the, the five of us. Um, and it was great. It was great. We had been talking about doing it for a while. Had a great time, and I saw all manner of things out there. Some of Birmingham's history, because Birmingham's history started over there in that Eagleton Mountain Ridge and spread it abroad. But in the middle of all the forestry, in the middle of all the greenery, in the middle of the parts that man has come along and cut into, I saw flowers growing. Beauty, just beauty, right there in the middle of the wilderness, Deacon. Deacon Moore, I bet you could tell about some places that man has hardly gone into because we can't drive down into it or we can't really walk without impediment. But deep into the recesses of some areas, God has allowed beauty to develop. And we shy away from that sometimes because it's the wilderness. We don't want to make that trick down into those places. And I came to tell you today that sometimes we got to get down into the wilderness. And then let me see if I can make it plain to you. There's a woman, and her name is Jean Feldman. She lives in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And all her life, she had imagined that she would be able to walk the full length of the Appalachian Trail. Now, for those of you who don't know that, the Appalachian Trail is 2,158 miles long. All right? 2,158 miles long. But this woman had a dream that she could walk in. She wanted to see all that God had done. For, for those of you who don't know, the Appalachian Trail stretches from Maine to Georgia. From Maine to Georgia. Now, now, now it's not my... It's not my job to question why she wanted to do it. All right? Because everybody's adventure is a little bit different. All right? But she wanted to do it. And the reason I'm telling you this is because the word that we're talking about today is Advent. All right? And Advent itself sounds kind of stale, kind of old. I can't get you there. But I wonder what happens when we turn Advent into an adventure. I wonder what happens when you turn your life's expectancy, the things you're going to, into an adventure. When you simply start looking at it differently. And that's why today I want to talk about the great adventure. It's simple. Jean's story, to me, details it very specifically. She had thought about doing the walk for years and did not start walking on the trail, Reggie, until she was 69 years old. That, that's when life afforded her the opportunity to get started on the trail when she was 69 years old. In 1988, Jean walked from Springer Mountain, Georgia to Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. That's about half the trail. She got sick. Oh, yeah, she got sick, so she had to stop. Every year after that, she would spend part of every summer walking as far as she could on the trail because she was on an adventure. She wanted to see all that God had put on this beautiful place. She walked until she couldn't walk anymore. Sometimes she'd be sidelined by physical injury. Ang her ankles were twisted or bronchitis or something. She'd get friends along the way. That's how life is. People will come along with you on a journey that you hadn't anticipated. Yeah, she met strangers who became like family because they were on the journey together. And finally, 
1995, August 25th, at the age of 76 years old. It was a time when some folk have gone and sat down a long time ago. Jean found herself cresting the top of the mountain at Katahdin in Maine. She and a friend, one but one person would have at the time. That's how life is sometimes. Everybody might start out cheering with you. But in the end, you might only have one good friend who sticks with you. And she and that friend crested the top of the mountain, and she completed the journey she had started in 1988. And so people came and they said, what did you do? How did you celebrate? She said, well, we didn't bring any champagne or anything like that. She said, my friend happened to pack a pie <laughs> on the journey. And she said, we sat there in the fog with the wind blowing, and we ate pie wow. to celebrate me reaching this milestone. I want you to dispel all the, all the rumors and TV shows about how your adventure in life is supposed to be. You keep trying to make it a perfect situation. And can I, come, can I tell you today that God didn't put perfect in our equation? Not until we get to the other side. And everybody's got a different adventure that they're going to go on if they're allowed. Unfortunately, I see too many folks who don't want to have an adventure at all. They just want life to come along. They want the Lord to wrap them in bubble wrap and never let anything to happen to them. They never step into anything that's risky or try anything that's hard. And can I tell you, that's just not how life is. It's not. It's not. This season of Advent that we have is calling us to the core responsibility we have as believers in Christ Jesus. I came to tell you today that you can't be a believer and be timid. You got to go out and attack what's going on. You got to meet life face, uh, full face and enjoy the adventure as much as you can. Can I tell you that there are not some things that will be enjoyable? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. See, this season of Advent is a reminder to us that this is a time for you to wake up, to have some expectancy. Some of us have been lulled to sleep by our conveniences, by the things we have in life that have stopped us from having to make good choices. I bet I couldn't go around the room and find folk who can remember 10 telephone numbers. We don't have to think like that no more. Right. No, if you lose your phone, you almost lose your mind. Because yeah. <laughs> everything you got in it is just convenient. I don't have to remember folks now. And guess what? That's a small indicator of how we are not close to people anymore. Yeah, I, I don't have to remember that. I used to have, I have a friend that I used to be able to call. Now, we're getting older. I can't do it anymore. I used to be able to call him. He was my telephone book. I could call him and say, hey, man, what's such and such telephone number? It didn't matter. He said, he just rattle it off. That was his thing. He could do it. He can't do it no more. Cell phone. In fact, in fact, I kind of went off on him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Friends can do this. Friends can do this. I kind of went off on him because every time he called a certain friend we have, he had to send me a text saying, man, please send me his telephone number. Now, for years, I was begging him for numbers. I said, do you know how to save a contact in your phone? But that wasn't the issue. The issue is us being connected and being able to support one another. And these modern conveniences stop us from doing that. Part of the adventure, though. When you say adventure, what comes to mind? When somebody says the word adventure to you, yeah, what else comes to mind when you say the word adventure? Travel. Yeah, what else comes to mind when you say the word adventure? Surprises. Yeah, yeah, when I say adventure, I start thinking about stuff I've seen in the public domain, in the movie theaters, like the stuff when I was going to, like Indiana Jones. That's an adventure, or, or maybe Star Trek. 
Yeah, yeah, lately my adventures have come from stuff like Harry Potter. You know, those, those are adventures to me. But have you ever considered that your life is an adventure? Have you ever considered that you are the central star in the adventure that God has for you? Have you ever considered that? You're not, a, you're not making a guest appearance in your own show. No, no, no. You're the star of what's going on. You should not be taking a side seat to anybody else involved. And yet, you've given somebody else too much control. You let other folk direct your adventure for you. You need to take over and be in charge of what God has in store for you. You were born and reborn to be in an adventure. According to a theologian, his name is Stanley Howes, an adventure is part of our central mission as believers. He writes, the most basic task of any church is to offer its people a sense of participation in an adventure. For finally what we seek is not power, nor is it security or equality, not even dignity, he writes. But we all see, each one of us seeks a sense of worth. And that worth is gained from our participation in and contribution to a common adventure. Some of us find church boring because we won't participate in the adventure of church. We go out and we try to help folk and we won't participate in supporting other people. Can I give you some examples? I, I see him sitting here. I always talk about him because I, I'm amazed at his courage. But, but Cam, a few years ago, went on an adventure that I'd love to go on. Cam went to India on a mission trip. He never been there before. It cost a lot of money to go. He was willing to invest his own resources. He was willing to invest his time. And he didn't know what he was going to face when he got to India. He didn't know if disease or peril or anything was ahead of him. And yet he dove head first into the adventure. And I can tell you right now, just in our conversation, some of the stuff that he experienced he probably doesn't have to experience any more in his life. <laughs> I, I, I can tell you that he met poverty that's at a level that you and I could never imagine. He, he met people who were struggling with their daily existence, struggling just to eat a meal day to day, struggling. In fact, the amount of money he had, which wasn't a whole lot, would have made him rich in India. And he discovered that because he went on the adventure of seeking what someone else had. And guess what? Realizing that you are rich according to someone else's standards makes you appreciate what God has done for you. It makes you understand that God hadn't forsaken you. He'd been blessing you all along. Now, I'm not saying that you have to go on a foreign mission in order to be in an adventure. I'm telling you that we got missions and adventure right around here every day. You want to find poor folk? Just step out the front door of this church. There's plenty of folk around us who are struggling every day. We've got a venture that's waiting for us if we'll just step out there and help them. I got a, an email the other day, Ferris. It seemed like it took all year for it to happen. Remember in May, we had our uh, service day? And we went and packaged 15,000 meals. Remember that? In a few hours, we did. Well, it wasn't until a month or so ago that the 15,000 meals we packaged reached their final destination. Wow. So this is what we did in May. We packaged meals to help people, and they didn't receive it until November. Uh, in Addis Ababa, Africa, that's where the food went we packaged. Now imagine if you are in Birmingham and you're on the packaging end. That's a different adventure than when you're in Addis Ababa and you need somebody from Birmingham to send you some food. That's a whole different adventure depending on the perspective that you're coming from. 
So just thinking about it from that perspective ought to make you say, thank you, Lord. I'm on the giving end and not the receiving end of this adventure. Oh, yeah, all you have to do is step out the door. I know we think we pull some poor sometimes, but can I tell you, I've heard people say they'd rather be poor in America any day than in some other parts of the world. Because at least we have folk not trying to hurt you and take everything from you in order just to eat the adventure. God has told us that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And despite the fact that he's given us these assurances, we still are afraid to step out on his promises and try new, uh, new uh, adventures. How about this? I know things are tough lately. But can I tell you that we got some folk in our congregation, people we know, who've been on an adventure for a long time. And they didn't plan it. No, 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 no. It wasn't nicely planned like Cameron's trip. There were no hostels to stay in. and There were no friends there who were helping them along the way. These adventures came unplanned. They just showed up in their lives like unexpected bills. You know how they show up and it just disrupts your whole, whole life. But when God calls us to adventure, that's a wake-up call for us. All right? It's like adventure is like a five-hour energy drink in our lives. That's what he calls us to. It's, it's, it's like a firecracker sitting up on a couch potato. It means get up. It's time for you to do something. We, we got to get ready to hit the trail. And let me tell you what that, what that looks like. Because some of us don't realize we've been in adventure for a long time. And sometimes we find ourselves in the wilderness, in the wilderness of life. Sometimes that wilderness is called sickness. Yeah, yeah. And there's some folk who've been in the wilderness of sickness for a long time. And, and the wilderness of sickness will take you, will take you through it. You, know, you never expect what's going to happen when you get into it. See, it's, it's one thing uh, when you sit in that doctor's office and they give you a diagnosis. And they start telling you, well, I think we're going to have to deal with this issue. But the question is, how do you respond? to that conversation you're having with that doctor. Some people decide they're going to retreat and go and become hermits and deal with it all by themselves. And yet another person will take it like it's the woman in North Carolina and say, I'm going to go on the adventure of a lifetime and we're going to deal with this situation the best way we can. Me and the Lord are going to deal with it the best way we can and we're going to see what lies ahead. And can I tell you, I know what I'm talking about because my brother James Thomas didn't anticipate what he was going through. No, 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 when the doctor gave him that diagnosis, he didn't know what all was going to lie ahead of him. And yet, I guarantee you, I can tell you, he's been in the wilderness, y'all. Yeah, he's been walking through and trying to figure out what's going on, but I've never spoken to him when he didn't have a good attitude about what he was going through. I've never spoken to him when he didn't say tomorrow's going to be better than it is right now. I've never spoken to him when he didn't see this sickness as an adventure. Now, I sat with a whole lot of folk, and when I got through with them, some of them I felt horrible when I got, not because they were sick, but because they were giving up. And then I sat with other people, and when I left, I was more encouraged than when I sat down. They taught me how to go through problems. I came to tell you it all depends on how you're deciding to go through the adventure of life. Sickness is one of them, but some people are suffering from sickness. Some people have been suffering from grief for a long time. Oh, grief is another wilderness. We wander through, through grief, and grief can make you do some strange things. Oh, I hope you know what I'm saying. Grief can make you greedy. Oh, grief can make you ugly. <laughs> Grief can make you take out actions against folk that you've been holding on to for a long, a long time. And it can bring out the worst, the worst in you. Grief is a wilderness that will tear you up. It'll tear your family up. And it just depends on how you deal with it. Now, if you've never been through grief, then you don't understand what I'm talking about. And it depends on who it is that died in terms of how you deal with it. We got too many families in here who have lost children. 
This time of year brings upon pain that's not like everybody else's pain when you're in that situation. When you're walking through that wilderness, this is supposed to be the most wonderful time of the year. And yet, when you're walking through the wilderness of grief, you can't think about it as the most wonderful time of the year. You have to fight your way through to maintain joy in the world. And depending on the circumstances that you're going through, you got to make sure that you keep a stiff upper lip, as they say, it, and show folk that you trust in the Lord when inside you're really crying because of what you've been experiencing. Grief is a wilderness that will ride you, and you can stay in that grief wilderness for a long, a long, long time. A lot of people will mask the symptoms of grief. Oh, yeah, you put on a mask. Sometimes that mask is called drinking or drugs, or so, sometimes it's simply depression that comes all over you, but can I tell you that he's not unacquainted with our grief. That, that's what the scripture says. The scripture says he wept for his own friends, so he understands what it is to lose somebody you love. Jesus expressed every emotion that you and I express. He understands what you and I go through, and I'm so thankful to say today, that when you're on this adventure, God is so good because just like when Fee Arthur is walking through those woods when he was an extension agent, and he'd walk upon just a beautiful little clearing. After all this thick brush and going through all these trees, he'd walk upon just the most beautiful place along the way. Can I tell you that life is like that? You can be struggling in the midst of grief, you can be struggling in the midst of sickness, and all of a sudden, the Lord will let you walk in on a clearing. The Lord will let you walk in on somebody you love. And it'll be like a flower coming in in your life. Somebody you haven't heard from in a long time will pick up the phone and call you and talk to you. And it'll be like a cool drink of water while you've been walking. Can I tell you that that's part of the adventure, part of the adventure of life. Some people call it, call it, when they're hiking, they call it trail magic. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like flowers in the middle of everything. Can I tell you that flowers grow in the junkyard? Can I tell you that? People, people don't believe it, but flowers will grow in the junkyard. You might think you're living in the junkyard of life, and maybe that's part of your adventure, but wait for it. Can I tell you? Just wait for it. God's going to show you something. He's going to show you how good he is to you. And I realize it's not sickness and it's not grief that everybody deals with. In fact, these days, just with the world events, you and I are struggling. We feel like we're in the wilderness every time we walk outside our house. You can't go anywhere anymore without feeling afraid or being in, intimidated. You can't go to the mall. You can't drive down the street. Everybody that looks like me and, has, uh, and is my gender... Is struggling these days. Yeah, if you live in America and you want to me, we feel like we in the, the wilderness. That anybody that takes a notion that I might not be doing the right thing can pick up the phone and call 911 and tell them uh, he's sitting up here eating a pie. <laughs> I mean, they'll report you for anything these, these days. You don't have to be not. Now, look, I was raised in a generation. That made sure that when I came out, I was trying to act right anyway. So I'm not trying to intentionally do anything wrong. And what I realize is we're so hypersensitive these days. The wilderness seems to be getting thicker and thicker with, uh, with, with people who are insensitive. And they'll call us out for anything. And sometimes that leads to tragedy in the form of people actually getting killed. And the only thing we can come up with as a reason for the reason they, that, that they got killed is because they were black. That's the only difference we can find in the situation. He wasn't doing anything wrong. He was just walking. He wasn't out of line. He wasn't disrespectful. And when I put everything else in the equation, the only difference in this wilderness is he was black. That makes it hard for us to walk around every day. And it's not just black men, it's people in general are struggling outside of their houses. Life is, is hateful these days, it seems. 
But can I tell you that Jesus still loves you? No, 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 no. This is important. Even when we're in the wilderness, we're still loved in the wilderness. He is not forsaking you based on your location. The Bible tells us there's nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ. There's nothing. It doesn't matter what you're going through. You still belong to him. Can I, can I make it plain to you? Anthony has left our house and gone various and sundry places around the country, around the world. No matter where he went, he was still my child. It, it didn't matter how he acted when he was there. He was still my child. It didn't matter if he was right or wrong while he was there. He was still my child. Can I tell you, when you belong to the master, it doesn't matter what you do, where you go. It doesn't matter the circumstances. You still belong to him. And guess what? He still loves you. That doesn't mean you won't have consequences. Life brings about consequences, but you know that you're loved by somebody. World issues don't dominate those who are in Christ. I'll give you this and then I'm out of here. It, happened. it happens that I've read the end of this book right here, and I know what happens. Even though I'm walking through this valley of the shadow of death, I still have the assurance that David had that I don't have to fear any evil. You know why? Because a shadow can't hurt me. No, no, no. A shadow. A shadow can't harm me. You've heard me say it before. The shadow of a bee can't sting me. The shadow of a snake can't bite me. The shadow of a bear can't harm me. And so the shadow of death is no problem. I'm walking through the valley. And I love this, that valley typically surrounded by woods. But my valley is a thoroughfare, not a destination. I might be in the valley for a long time, but I came to tell you this morning that I'm not going to stay in the valley. Yeah, you can't have a valley without having hills on the side. And I'm just going through the valley. I'm coming out on the other side. And can I tell you this? In case you don't understand how I'm celebrating, if you have never been through a valley, just keep walking. Because you're either on your way through a valley or you're on your way to a valley. In 1989, Bishop Desmond Tutu preached in front of the South African Embassy in Washington, D.C. 1989, for those of you who don't have a basis for historical reflection, you don't understand how the world was then. You don't understand the wilderness that was going on then, particularly in South Africa. You don't understand that there was a whole system of government that treated people differently based on their race, based on how they look. Now, we weren't far from it here in America, but we had gotten far enough through that, through the wilderness, to be able to help him out. But there was a system in place called apartheid that folk had spent their whole lives trying to dismantle. One such man, you hear about it, you wear his t-shirt, but you don't know that he spent 30 years in prison. And I came to tell you right now that I don't care how strong a person you are, 30 years is 30 years. That's 30 years you're away from your family. That's 30 years you're being mistreated and underfed. 30 years that you are in a wilderness of some type, and yet God saw him through it. Nelson Mandela came out on the other side, and he vowed that apartheid would be destructed under his watch. He vowed that another generation wouldn't have to live under a system like that. He was willing to trade in 
his 30 years in prison for his risk taking and running for office to make a change. So my question to you is, what are you willing to go through based on what you've experienced? And so Desmond was preaching in front of the embassy. And from the wilderness, he started talking about a concept that you and I don't understand. And that, under, that concept is called nonviolence. Okay. Okay. He wasn't the first one to come up with it. But he let the folk know, because he was preaching outside, but he was talking to the South African folk on the inside, the ones still stuck in the wilderness of apartheid. And this is what he said. He said, those of you inside, are you listening? Do, do, do you hear me? I came to say the same thing to you, 45th Street. You, that the folk on the inside who are struggling with wrong, he said, you've already been defeated. Desmond preached. He said, you've already lost, and we on the outside have already won. Out here, we know how this struggle for freedom and liberation will turn out. For God is always on the side of the oppressed. It's not we shall win, Desmond said. He said, oh no, we have already won. He said, only you on the inside have not realized that we have already won. We outsiders have, and we know the future, he said, because we are the future. I came to tell you today, 45th Street, that if you want Birmingham to be better, we got to make it better. We got to get out of these walls, and we got to go help folk live better lives. If we want to make life better, then we're going to have to take some risks. And that's going to have to risk your safety, your resources, if you want life to get better. If you want Cree to live a better life. Okay. If you want little, 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 little Ellington to live a better life. If you want little George to live a better life. Then you're going to have to sacrifice something on this side. Yeah, the wilderness can be a training time for all of us but we gotta do something on the other side. I've got that confidence that you and I can turn this Advent season into an adventure season. I just can't wait to see what's gonna come on the other side. I know you got some decisions you need to make in your life. Can I tell you that God is with you in those decisions? He already knows what's best for you. Just keep on walking. Keep on trusting in him. Can I tell you? that he doesn't leave folk alone. Oh no, he can take a, a little 12 or 13 year old girl and he can tell her that you're gonna have my baby. Oh yeah, and she said, well Lord, how can I have a baby when I've never been with a man? When God tells you you're gonna have a baby, I don't care if it's a man or a woman, <laughs> you better get ready to buy some a bassinet because you're gonna have a baby. <laughs> Because when God says it, it's so. She did. She had a baby. And he told her that the nature of this baby was going to be one that he came to rescue folk. The sad thing is some folk didn't even know they needed rescue. I came to tell you today, we were born in a wilderness. I'm going to say that one more time. We were born in a wilderness trying to find our way out into the light. Jesus Christ is the light that we were trying to find. I'm so glad I made it out of that wilderness. And I saw the light. It was high and lifted up. And there was a man who used to be on that light post. His name is Jesus. He's the baby that Mary had. I put my trust in him, Anthony. And I taught you to put your trust in him. And I taught her to put her trust in him. I expect you to take your children and teach them the same thing and your children and teach them the same thing and if we do that guess what this little light of mine will keep on shining over and over and over again do you know him do you know this man named jesus have you trusted him have you given your life to him jt is trusting him right now he might not be here today but wherever he is jt is trusting him I guarantee you, he's struggling. He's still in the wilderness, but Jesus Christ is still taking care of him. There are some I don't even know about who are struggling. 
I got a prime example in this congregation of somebody who's been trusting the Lord for 105 years. You saw Matty Hankins two weeks ago come in here 105 years old. She didn't do nothing but give God the glory. I can't imagine the adventure of 105 years of life. And yet she had the same testimony you ought to have right now. That if it had not been for the Lord on her side, she didn't know where she'd be. So let me give you this. If you've never tried Jesus, then I offer him to you. Try him. Try him. Let him be your guide through this wilderness experience. He's, in, he's given me the authority. Given me the authority to invite you to be a part of his kingdom, of his family, of his life. Gentlemen have come because they're just a welcome committee, welcoming you into the family of Christ. So if you've never been baptized before, you never recognized the need, turn your life over to him, and now it's just dawned on you, <clears throat> then I open an invitation to you. Maybe you've been baptized and you've decided, I need to find somewhere to fellowship. Maybe that's the case today, and if that's the case, then I invite you to join our fellowship. I invite you to come and be a part of who we are here. We're not perfect. No, you won't ever find us claiming to be perfect. We're trying to be the friendly church from the parking lot to the pulpit. We invite you to come and to try with us. Doors of our church are wide open. Whosoever will, let them come right now. Sing down at the altar. Down at the altar. You can be free. From sin. From sin. 